Hi, I'm Alex Cornishelli, and welcome to our kitchen. I am so excited that you've joined to cook along with me. Today, we're gonna make seared hanger steak with red onion rings. What is better than a sweet, batter-dipped, homemade onion ring? The onion rings are fried fresh and salted, and then they're paired with a seared hanger steak that's glazed with a little bit of balsamic vinegar, and it creates that perfect salt and vinegar combination. And it's kind of a little bit steakhouse too. This is a definite crowd pleaser. Now before you begin, you're gonna to wanna to pour four cups of canola oil into a heavy bottom pot and clip a thermometer to the side. Now watch the temperature and monitor the oil as you heat it. You wanna get it to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. You're also gonna need a baking sheet lined with a kitchen towel, because after we fry our onion rings, we immediately need a place to land with those hot onion rings season them with salt and, you know, nibble on a few. So let's get cooking. To start, we're gonna make the batter for the onion rings. You're gonna want the batter to sit for like 15 minutes after you mix all the ingredients together. So, there's a little bit of booze in this batter, but it's not without reason. We're gonna start with a 12 ounce beer. I like to use a pale lager, something that's not too assertive flavor-wise, but gives that little kind of almost yeasty taste to the batter that we love on an onion ring. It's a taste we don't even realize is there that you're gonna love. And then two ounces of vodka. I know it sounds like we're making a cocktail. I promise you we're making a batter. It's gonna turn into a batter in a minute. A cup of sparkling water. I've used sparkling water, club soda. Now we want a little bit of heat there, but not too much, right? So just half a teaspoon of paprika, just a little zip, not too spicy, and one teaspoon of baking soda. The baking soda is a leavener. It gets everything together. You see, once we add that, everything starts to take shape. So whisk. You'll see you've got this frothy liquid. It's kind of exciting, right? I mean, when was the last time you put sparkling water and beer and vodka into a bowl to make something to eat? Whisk that to break it up and let the spice and everything go through. The only thing we haven't added is the flour. You don't want to overwork flour, right? Flour doesn't like to get up early and go to the gym. It doesn't want to work out, right? So we put that in last. So we have everything all whisked together, and now we're going to add just one and a half cups of all-purpose flour. And I do like my mom did with a knife, pat it down and level it off. Great way to measure. Measuring your ingredients for things like batters, cakes, whatever, is underrated. It's really worth it. No great chef eyeballs the measurements. Half a cup of flour to add, so we've got one and a half total. Right in there. And then we just whisk. You wanna whisk gently. Right? We want to try to get that flour slowly to start to dissolve in all this liquid. And all that alcohol that's in the batter says to the flour, hey, relax, okay? Settle down, all right? Keeps everything in check. And that's good. That's how you make a good batter. Smell it. It smells like halfway like a loaf of bread and halfway like something you would get at an Irish bar, right? No insults intended, I love a good Irish bar. Whisk on the sides, gathering it up, making sure there are no big lumps of flour. Now this seems a little bit loose to me, actually. And you can tell. So I'm gonna actually add another smidge of flour, another quarter cup. And you can kind of hear the bubbles and hear the batter starting to come together right when you mix all of this. And that's kind of a judgment call, right? If your batter looks a little liquidy, like if you dipped an onion in and it wouldn't stick, add another quarter cup of flour. Okay, so once the flour is mixed, set this aside somewhere near the stove or somewhere warm, ideally, and let it rest for about 15 minutes while we get our other parts of the dish together. So I'm gonna put that to the side. And now you see I've got a cutting board on top of another cutting board, 
right? I've got a little gel board on here. And generally, if I'm cutting meat or fish, I'll put another gel board on here, deal with my meat or my fish, and then get it cooking, put the board away, wash my hands, and when I come back to my work surface, I'm still good to go and clear. So another little smaller board for proteins and other things to separate out, especially things like chicken, can be actually a great way to make your work more efficient. See, we're already thinking like a chef. You see what's happening here? Okay, my board. Hanger steak, that's what we're cooking. This is a super flavorful and relatively speaking, not that expensive cut of beef, which is why I love it. It's a chef's favorite, right? Beefy, meaty, and not insanely priced. This is a whole hanger steak, by the way, whole. You might see it like this at the butcher shop and you might see it more like how we're gonna cut it down. This is about just over two pounds, right? And you can see we've got some nice fat and marbling in here, which is great. Can you also see that we have this kind of, this long line of fat right in the middle? That's what we want to cut out and separate. Now you could cook this whole and slice it and eat it and have no problem. I like to, to cut it down into two smaller pieces and get rid of that middle piece of fat. And you can see that meat often comes with dotted lines. And to my mind, that's a dotted line right there. So I'm gonna go on the, just to the left of that fat and slice down. And you, you, you notice I'm using a pretty big knife, right? Not too much sawing and you'll separate that out. Okay, we've got some nice fat on the outside here. I'm not gonna trim that off. That's delicious. But what I have here is this long kind of tough nerve running down the middle. So I'm just literally gently going to go just right directly on the other side. See that, that line we had on top? Just right directly on the other side and I'm going to cut straight down. You can see that. Notice how with my left hand I'm pulling away from the knife, so there's this tension. And that helps me lift off what I don't want, because I'm pulling it off. Can you see that? That big nerve running down here, super chewy and tough. Great for things like bone broth. You can wrap this up, freeze it, collect little scraps of meat like this in your freezer, and when you have a pound or two, you can boil it all gently on the stove and make a great bone broth, or a stock or soup. Okay, so now we have these two pieces of hanger steak kind of ready to go. So I'm gonna put that back on my, I always have like a plate or something where I season my meat and I get ready to cook it. Okay, but I, we are done butchering. So I'm gonna get rid of this board, put this scrap of meat to the side and wash my hands and come back and we'll cook this steak, right? I love this idea that now my board is clear again. I'm gonna wash my hands. Okay. So our batter is resting. We're letting that hang out. It's getting nice and thick. I've got a cast iron on here. You could use a heavy bottom stainless steel or a cast iron, kind of over medium heat. I can feel the heat building in here. And now we're just gonna season our steak. Super simple step, critically important for good tasting food, the salt. We're gonna sprinkle high from above. Notice I'm moving my hands back and forth. It's like this, right? Like when you say, give me some, give me some money, you're gonna do the same with the salt. It's right all the way down the length of the steak. Okay, and on the other side, just turn it over. You really want to season steak generously. That's how you get that true delicious beef, beef flavor. Again, same thing, all down the length. Now we're going to use some canola oil. I'm just going to drop mm, a tablespoon or two into the skillet, and I'm going to wait until I visibly see 
the oil start to separate and move from the center to the sides of the pan and start to smoke a little bit. That's when we know that the oil is hot enough. And that's how when you sear fish, meat, whatever, if you have that telltale sign of really hot oil in a hot pan, your protein is not going to stick to the bottom, which is, I know, so frustrating when you cook meat or fish. You spend a lot of time and money and it sticks and it rips. It can be really disappointing. Okay. Do we see that smoke? You see that oil thinning out in the pan? What a satisfying noise. I dropped the first piece in towards the top of the pan. And then the second piece far away from it near the bottom. Why? Why leave room? Why not just drop them in together? If there is a separation, as the meat starts to give off its water and steam escapes, there'll be enough room between them and the oil hot enough that they'll start to brown instead of just sharing a steam bath and ending up looking boiled. Really important when you're cooking steak. Right after I drop them in the hot oil and I give them a minute to kind of start getting hot and browning on that bottom side, just move them a little bit, just give them a little shake just to make sure that they're browning and that they're not sticking anywhere to the bottom of the pan. Now, did you notice that we have two pieces of hanger steak and one is a little bit bigger than the other? That means we'll take this first smaller piece out probably a, a minute or two earlier and let that bigger piece cook a little bit longer. I feel like when we cook things, we think, okay, I'm just gonna cook everything this long. These are different sizes, right? So we're gonna wanna cook that bigger piece just a tiny bit longer. I would say we're gonna sear these on all sides and probably let them cook a total of about, I don't know, eight to 10 minutes. Then we'll take them out. And the most important thing is we're gonna let them rest. So when you drop steak into a pan, all the blood inside the meat goes, oh my God, what? This is the Titanic, what happened? And all the blood goes to the middle of the meat, right? And when you take the meat out of the pan and you let it rest, the blood is like, oh yeah, okay, and flows back through the meat. That's why the resting is so important because it'll, it'll, it'll create that juicy factor. Now, as far as searing meat goes, you read a lot online about how searing meat creates a crust on the outside and locks in all these juices. No, it doesn't. Searing meat doesn't lock in any juices. Um, all of this is gonna come out of the meat no matter how we cook it. What searing the meat does is it browns the meat and that tastes delicious. That's all we want from browning our meat is to get that delicious steakhouse taste at home. So it's been a couple of minutes. I'm gonna turn this over and you can see what a beautiful crust I'm getting, right? And I'm even parking these two pieces now and they're hugging the corners of the pan where the oil is pooling a little bit. We wanna have that right in that hot oil and no separation between the two pieces of meat so that the steam can escape and they brown really well. We're cooking with gas around here. Now, hanger steak is definitely a tougher cut of meat. It actually is situated in not so romantic a place on the cow. It's surrounding the diaphragm of the cow, right? So when the cow is breathing, the hanger steak is part of the meat that's participating in that breathing in and out. This is a piece of meat that's worked hard in its life. So it's, it's a little bit tougher, right? It's not the fancy filet mignon that's hanging out on a beach chair doing not much of anything and being super tender. So we really want to sear it to, to get that beautiful brown crust and taste of that meat on the outside. And we want to give it time to cook. Then we're going to slice it against the grain. You see that a lot. Cut it against the grain. And people say to me, I know wood has a grain, like this cutting board, right? We can see the grain in the cutting board, right? But in meat, what does a grain mean? But look at this, for example, this hanger steak. You can see that much like the grain of this cutting board, the hanger steak has a grain too. And when we slice it up and serve it, you wanna cut against that grain. And by cutting against the grain, that's one more step we can always take with meat to make a tougher cut, eat and chew more tender.
And we love that, right? That's our job. Make the best ingredient the absolute best version of itself. I'm just turning it on the side. You see all that, that steam escaping? That's a good sign. Look how beautiful and brown. You can see I'm standing it up a little bit. Notice how I'm using the pan as a support system to hold the meat up as I sear it on all sides. Another really important thing. See how smart we're getting? Don't be afraid to let it hug the edges of the pan. Lots of space between, much better. Better browning. Get rid of the plate. We had the raw meat on. We don't need that anymore. If you want to be really serious, you can change your tongs for a fresh pair. And when you're making this recipe, you want to be really one step ahead of yourself and have a place to land with your meat once it's cooked to let it rest. So here's a little plate I'm just going to have hanging out. We've got our batter. By the way, check in on your batter if you get a little, you know, sick of watching the steak. Give that a whisk. And I think it was Julia Child who dropped a chicken on the floor and said, I'm very glad this is happening. Um, she was the type of teacher who liked when mistakes happened on her watch so you could learn with her. And I'm having one of those moments. Because here we've already added another quarter cup of flour above and beyond what the recipe called for. I'm going to add another quarter cup just because it looks a little liquidy. It looks like it's not going to coat the onion. So I'm going to add another quarter cup. That makes a half a cup more. And you got to kind of work with the batter. You want to kind of look for a consistency that's going to coat whatever you're frying, right? That's all we're looking for. This looks pretty good. I'm even going to add another quarter cup. And this just goes to show you that it takes a little trial and error, even when you follow a recipe. Now, this looks right to me. You can see how it's, you see how it's starting to look like I could dip something in there and it would coat it? That's all we're looking for. And just whisk enough so that all the flour is mixed in. Wow, that's a lot of extra flour. Now, steak is starting to look really beautiful. Last side. See all that hissing? It's one thing to hear a little sizzle. It's another when you get the hiss. The hiss is just something I look for when, when I'm cooking something like steak. To me, it means our surface is really hot and we're getting that beautiful browning on the outside, which tastes so good. And I'm actually, honestly, going to take the smaller piece out. One thing I always say about cooking anything, if you undercook it a little bit, you can just throw it back in the pan and cook it another minute or two or pop it in the oven. If you overcook it, you can't get it back. So always err slightly on the side of undercooking if you're not really sure. And that way you can always throw it back in and cook. For a rare-ish steak, around 120, 125, medium rare, 130, 135, medium-ish, 135, 140, into the 40s, Medium well, we're getting into the 150s, and well, we're getting to 165. So if you like well done meat, you can literally gauge it, and I just use like a, I just pop a little thermometer right in the thickest part of the meat, take its temperature. That way you don't have to cut into it or play any guessing games. As a chef, I often get asked, does it bother you when people order well done meat at the restaurant? Do you wish everybody would eat your meat medium rare? Uh, I don't. Um, I think people should eat meat the way they want to eat it, you know? It's your life, it's your steak. Cook it the way you want. Now you'll notice also that I've been moving this meat around a lot as I cook it, right? I like to think of meat like a snow globe, right? You know when you have the snow globe sitting there and it's been sitting on your desk for a while and then you pick it up and you shake it and all the snow it's the same with meat. The more you move it around, the more you move that blood inside the meat around, it's almost like basting the meat, right? We don't want to just let it sit and hang out in one spot. We want to move it back and forth.
Here's the other beauty of steak. When you, when you cut a, cook a bigger cut like this, you have a part that's probably naturally gonna be a little bit thinner and a part that's gonna be a little thicker. So you could get a piece that's kind of medium and then where the meat is a little bit thicker, it's gonna be more rare or medium rare. Um, my mother always liked steak medium and my dad always liked it medium rare. So a cut like this is perfect for them. Half of it, the thicker, less done part for dad and the thinner, more cooked part for mom. Sometimes nature makes meat for everybody at once, right? I think that's good. Take it off, let it rest. So now's a good time to pause while the meat's resting and the batter's ready. When we come back, we're gonna fry onion rings and have a little steakhouse meal. All right, so we're set up to fry our onion rings. What does set up mean? It means I've got my batter, I like the texture, I've got medium-ish, medium to large peeled red onions that we're gonna start cutting. Remember that pan coated with the towel that we said that we were gonna get together in the beginning? You want that front and center and right near your hot oil heating on the stove. And I'm just, I've got half an eye on the thermometer there. We want the oil at 375. Right now I'm at like 330-ish and counting. So let's start cutting our onion rings. Just cut the little end off you know, with that root end, we don't, we don't want that on there. And then cut your peeled red onions into rounds that are about one and a half to two inches thick. And again, the little end bits, you can put those to the side. And this is really fun. Making onion rings, I mean, this is one of those times when I think that I can't believe my profession is cooking, right? Because it's just so fun. And you'll notice that as I cut the onions, right? I cut that little bit off. You'll notice I'm holding it and pressing down because it's a little bit round, right? It wants to move. So make sure you really hold it steady when you make your cuts. And then when you've made your next cut, ooh, and this is making me tear up, hold it on both sides with the knife in between, right? And then there's no chance that you'll cut yourself, or less of a chance anyway, right? People ask me all the time, how do I stop getting teary-eyed cutting onions? The onion makes us teary-eyed. It's a natural defense of be against being cut up and eaten, right? That's Mother Nature's built-in insurance policy for onions. And honestly, one of the best ways to avoid having the teary onion eye is cutting them with a really sharp knife. It actually helps. I know a dull knife might make you feel a little bit safer, it's actually um, a, sharp knife, a sharp knife that's better. The other thing I do is um, wear sunglasses. I'm not kidding. Okay, once we have the onions, right, just break them into individual rings. Just pull them apart. They naturally want to come apart. Don't be afraid if some of the smaller ones have two layers stuck together. It's cool. If you like your onion rings a little bit thicker, you can leave two rounds stuck together or make them thinner and we're essentially making a big raw pile of onions that we're gonna get ready to batter, dip, and fry. Fun. Some people marinate these, by the way. You can marinate them in a little bit of buttermilk or throw a splash of vinegar over them. I honestly like an onion ring to be super oniony, so I don't put anything on them. And we made this delicious batter, remember? The vodka, the beer, um, and that's what these are gonna get dumped in. So you break apart all your onions. You want to do the same for all your onions. I have a lot here, so I'm going to start frying this batch. Notice how I try to always keep the space right in front of me clean and clear. That's how I know my head's on straight and I know what I'm doing. Try to keep the space in front of you clear. Pretend it's your desk at the office. Now when you're frying, you've got hot oil in the mix, right? So you want everything super close together and you want to be super ready before you fry anything, right? I've got my little skimmer or spider. That way I can take the onions right out of the hot oil when they're fried, and they fry pretty quickly. I've got my batter um, right next to the oil. You see that? So I don't have far to travel. I don't want a lot of space to travel from batter to oil, and I don't want a lot of space to travel from oil to tray. Very important. 
to create this little triangle, I call it. Dunk, fry, rest. You want to be ready. You also want to have salt nearby before you start because the minute those hot onion rings come out of the oil, right on there with the salt. So the salt sticks to the hot oil. Once the onion ring cools, the salt's like, hey, what's up? And the onion ring is like, sorry, I cooled off, okay? Really important. Super simple thing, got to be ready. And I feel like we're ready. And I see my oil is at 375, so I'm going to drop a few uh, just rounds in, just two. And you can do this with your hands or a pair of tongs, depending on how messy you get. You want to pull it out and have it coat. And we're just going to drop two in there. You can, you know, get a little excess off. Just drop two in there as a tester. Never commit fully to the oil without knowing, you know, kind of testing. Put a toe in the pool first. So we're putting one or two onion rings in here. And don't be afraid to kind of, you see how I'm moving them around a little bit? I'm even going to flip them on their other side gently, right? We're dealing with very hot oil. Gently flip them over. You want to hear that sound, that bubbly sound. When you drop an onion ring in the batter and right in the oil, it should rise to the surface very quickly, right? That's how you know your oil's hot and ready. If you get one and you drop it in, your oil's not quite hot enough and it sinks and the onion ring's looking up at you like, wah, wah, I'm at the bottom of the pool, check your thermometer and bring your oil up again before you add more. Look how good this looks. Now you can, you see I'm kind of using a tongs to do this because these onion rings are pretty big, right? If I were frying a lot of little shallots or something, I might want to use a different utensil. So you can use any of these to kind of move your onion rings around and get your onion rings out. How do we know if it's done? Well, here's the beautiful thing about something like an onion ring. The minute the batter is golden brown on all sides, I call that done. It's about the batter. And look at these first two. These are our testers. Look at our tester onion rings. Come on. You can touch it right away, salt. Right away. Right on there. OK? So I, pretty good, right? So we're going to drop more in there. Now that I feel comfortable with the temperature of my oil, I'm going to drop more onion rounds into the batter and get them soaking for a minute and start frying. You're going to fry something like this in batches, right? We can't fry nearly all the onion rings we need at once. So check the temperature of your oil in between batches and make sure that it's back up to 375, right? Because dropping cold pieces of onion lowers the temperature of your oil. So in between each batch, make sure that oil is still hot enough. If not, what happens is, right, the onions sink to the bottom, they're soggy, the batter's grumpy, you know? We don't want any of that. I'm just dropping them in here. You could use smaller onions, by the way, and do lots of little onion rings, fried shallots, and this batter is really good any of those things, depending on what you like. Why pick a red onion for an onion ring, right? I think they're more traditionally yellow or white onions. Um, I like that little kind of bite and texture that red onions have. It's really a textural thing more than anything. And honestly, any type of onion you like will do well here. If you get your hands on some spring sweet onions like Vidalia's or Maui onions, those are delicious. A classic yellow onion you have hanging around on your counter. You were going to make tomato sauce and you didn't. You can use those for onion rings too. But they're so fun. Sometimes I like them more than french fries. Sometimes. If you are a salt and vinegar person, by the way, and we're playing with a little bit in, that, in this recipe because we're using some balsamic vinegar on the steak, but you can also get some vinegar powder and make these salt and vinegar onion rings by just putting them, just putting some uh, vinegar powder on them. And what I'm doing right now is, after they brown on one side, I'm just turning them over in the oil so that they fry on both sides. This is making me so hungry. Notice how I'm not moving. Notice how close everything is. That's actually the safest way to fry something in hot oil. Have everything close together and have every step thought out before you start. It's like planning a wedding, folks, you know? You gotta get that dress, you gotta get that cake, you gotta book the caterer before you do it.
This is really a great moment because I just, when onion rings come out of the oil, they just look so good. Check this out. And, and we're doing this together and you're doing this at home. Look at, look at this. Stop. I'm actually going to drop salt right on there. A little sprinkle. More. Look at this. Stop it. Do you look at a tray of onion rings or french fries and pick out the ones that you like the most? Like, these are the ones I'm gonna eat and then I'll give the rest to my family? Because that's completely what you should do here. You know what I'm saying? I'm checking my oil. It's a pretty good temp. I'm still in the like 360 zone. I'm cool with that. You see I'm just dunking them in the batter and then turning them over just to make sure they got a nice coating. This is really fun, isn't it? I could make, really, I could, I could get into making these for an hour or two and not really notice the time going by. So I'm going to cut up the rest of my onions, fry them up, and then when we come back, we're going to cut up the steak and make a steakhouse plate and taste. The moment of truth where it all comes together. Let's look at our hanger steak that's been resting, right? We cook that. Probably got some lovely juices on your plate too, right? Looks good. Now this serves about four, right? So we have two pieces of steak. Each piece here is gonna serve about two. And we used four onions for the onion rings. So that's about an onion per person. I think that's about right, don't you? Okay. Cutting our steak. Let's cut this big guy. You can see that with the hanger steak, we have that natural grain, like the grain of wood, in the meat. And one of the things to tenderize it is to cut against the grain. So it's going this way. I'm going to cut this way. Imagine making an X. The grain is one way, and your knife cuts the other. You just slice. You can do thicker or thinner slices. Doesn't really matter. I like about an, I don't know, an inch to a half an inch. You can see that because this cut of meat is a different thickness, I get a little varying degree of doneness. You hear that sound when your knife hits the crust of the meat? So good. Okay. So let's make ourselves a plate of food, shall we? We earned it. Now, the meat is cooked and rested, still hot. Tiny sprinkle of salt just to finish. A little bit in the beginning, a little bit in the end, very important. And then I'm going to drizzle a little balsamic vinegar right on top. What a combination. A little balsamic vinegar right on your beef. No vinaigrette, no fancy pan sauce. Just straight up a little bit of that balsamic right there. If you want to plate it in kind of a chef -y way, you could use your tongs. Right? You see I've got some from the thicker part that are kind of eh, medium-ish, a little on the medium-rare side. And then some from the thinner part, which is tapered off to the end, that are more in the medium or medium, yeah, medium direction, right? There's a reasonable size. We've got our balsamic on the plate. I'm trying to clean those edges if you want to get really chefy. And then just pile those. Can you hear that? That sound of the crust on the outside of these onion rings? You can just pile them up, have fun with it, right? They can kind of be cascading, bigger ones, small ones. They can kind of invade a little bit of the steak space. Put a tiny bit of vinegar, if you want, on the bottom of the plate. This is making me so hungry. If you want to, a little bit of those juices from your meat resting, and just pour some of those back over the steak, too. We've got a little built-in sauce from the pan drippings and the balsamic. And we are ready to taste. OK, the moment of truth we've all been waiting for. How does it taste? All our hard work. Cut a little bit of that steak. 
<laughs> wow. So purely just beefy and meaty, steakhouse-y. I love the mixture of the little bit of pan drippings with the vinegar and the taste of that crust we built on the outside. Juicy, really good. Let's make sure the onion rings are up to snuff. Kind of always start with a big one. Can you hear how good this onion ring is? Mmm. Mmm. -hmm. I love the taste of the batter on the outside. I also love the juiciness of the red onion slice on the inside. And that bit of salt we put on when the onion ring is hot is the first taste you get when, you're, when your mouth touches the onion ring. You get that burst of salt, the taste of that beer in the batter, and then the juicy red onion in the middle. This is just a no-brainer. You're going to love it.